morning, everybody. I say good morning, everybody. That's good to be in church. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So welcome to the presence of the Lord. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. As you take your seat, just wave to your neighbor and say welcome in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Well, welcome, everybody. Amen. I want to share with you this morning on the offering, and I want to go to the Gospel, St. Mark's Gospel. St. Mark's Gospel, chapter number 10. Mark, chapter 10. When you're there, you say, Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for the rain. Amen. Amen. Rain speaks of newness. Rain speaks of blessing. Hallelujah. To some, rain is a reason to come to church and thank God. To others, it's a reason to stay away from church. I don't know why. But we thank God for the rain. Amen. As we go, before I share, I want to share something that really touched my heart yesterday. Um, yesterday we had a memorial service for two of my grandmothers who passed away in 2020. And uh, we had it at the Anglican Church in town. What amazed me was, you know, it reminded me of something. I think, you know, sometimes we become, we become too comfortable in church. In the sense that when we come to, to some, coming to church, there's a reason because you come to praise God and you become a participator. You participate in the service. And then to others, unfortunately, it's kind of like entertainment, which it should not be. You know, normally you find if there's nobody in the front to lead the church in singing, everybody's silent and they rely on the people in the front. But the people in the front are the ones, they are the ones that are leading us, but we too should also partake in that mission. Now yesterday, there was no instrument at all. No instrument, not, not even a microphone. And as they sang, they sang all the hymns and some of the psalms. And I was touched by that. And I shared with Pastor Sheldon, I said, what really touched me is that because the whole church, the whole body sang, you could feel it. It filled that place. The voices filled that place. And I said to Pastor Sheldon, we don't hear that at church. It's sad, but it's true. I mean, we're praising God. It's a song that you can clap, you can dance. I mean, there they don't clap, they don't dance. I'm not running with God. Not, you don't misunderstand me. But all I'm saying is, we have hands to clap. We can dance. We can sing. You know, sometimes I speak to the praise and worship team, and they say to me, Pastor, sometimes in church, I don't know. That's what comes from the praise and worship. The guys in the front, they say the people in the church, they just, it's like you had a bath in starch. It's like, you know, you've got this law in yourself. I shall not be moved. Thou shall not move. Thou shall not clap. Thou shall not dance. Oh God, I pray that you release grace and deliver them this morning. Brothers and sisters, you are not singing for the pastor. You are not singing for the praise and worship team. You are not singing for your neighbor. You are singing for God. Amen. You know, listen, listen. Do you know when you, listen, when you pray, when you pray, angels get moving. Prayer 
moves angels. But praise, praise is something I think we need to understand the power of praise. Praise moves God. You see, when Israel was faced with Jericho, many of you are faced with Jericho. God did not tell Israel, go and pray by the walls. God told them to praise. You remember that? They marched. At the last round, at the end, they had to make a noise. They had to praise God. Because what happens? The book of Psalms tells us that God inhabits. To inhabit means to dwell in. God inhabits the praises of his people. So if you want to be raised from where you are, you've got to learn to praise. It doesn't matter how low you may be in your life. But if you, if you can get to a place where you can praise God in spite of your loneliness, in spite of your loneliness, in spite of your position, God will raise you through your praise. Because God now, He makes His throne in that praise that you are praising him in. And when God steps into praise, no foundation, that's why you find the walls of Jericho. No man could ever rebuild it because when Jericho's walls fell, the walls did not fall like we think it fell to the left or to the right. The walls caved in, the walls went down. The foundations gave way, the foundations, the foundations were destroyed. And that caused those walls to cave down. And then the Bible said, the man who will ever rebuild those walls will be cursed. So what am I getting across to you this morning? Is that when you can praise God, understand He's God most high. In His presence, no flesh shall glory. In His presence, Nothing unholy shall stand. So if there is a limitation in your life or any problem that you are facing, when you learn to get to a place where you praise God, the foundations of those things need to go. And here it is. If anybody has built that wall of limitation for you and you praise God, that wall crumbles and anybody that tries to rebuild that wall of limitation they cannot rebuild it because God will deal with them they, they bring a curse upon themselves because you are blessed I wonder if you're getting what I'm saying if you understand what I'm saying that when you come to church become a participator there's an anointing here. But for you to activate it, you need to participate. That's why Bartimaeus, the woman of the issue of blood, many of those who were healed and were touched by Jesus, they recognize that there's an anointing and they recognize that they need to do something. They need to participate. Because there's something in the atmosphere. But if you do not participate, you cannot ever expect to receive. In fact, you delay your breakthrough. So I want to encourage you from today to begin to praise God and participate in the service. Can I ask you a question? Have you got a mouth? Have you got breath? The Bible says that everything that has breath, praise ye the Lord. So if you've got breath, that is breath that God has borrowed to you. It's not yours, it's his. The day God has 
decide to take that little bit of bread from you, you are corpse. But the fact that you have that bread, that's a reason to thank God and praise Him for that bread. You may find that through praising Him with that bread, God will lengthen the number of years that He's borrowed you that way. You see that? I just thought I'll share that. Because if I do not share that with you, it's something God has revealed to me. And if I do not share that with you, I'll stand before God, your blood will be on my hands. So I, I have told you what God has made in my heart. So I can stand before God, guiltless of your blood. Because the judgment, understand, people think being a pastor is so easy. The judgment on a pastor, or a teacher, or evangelist, or a prophet, that judgment on any minister in that fivefold office is more severe. It's a double judgment. I have responsibility, I have a duty as a man of God to tell you and correct you when God shows you that you need correction. My spiritual father often times would also do the same, Pastor Singh, Pastor Zubaydah, very often would also correct me and I receive the correction, I receive the instruction. Because if you cannot be teachable and you cannot be corrected, you will never grow as a Christian. Come on, somebody. Amen. It's through correction that we become better. When the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, He corrects. That's the Bible. That's what God says. Not what I say. Amen. Now, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, I want to share with you this. From verse 17, the Bible says, Now, as he, Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running. In other words, somebody came running, knelt before Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? It's like asking Jesus, what shall I do that I may partake of the life you came to give? For many people, for many people, experiencing the reality of the kingdom of God, the reality of heaven, is when they close their eyes and breathe their last. But did you know that God's intention, God intended for us to have a taste of heaven whilst we're living on the earth? That's why we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is where? In heaven. Do you think in heaven there are people crying? Do you think in heaven there are people that are so sad they can't move? In heaven they are worshipping God, praising God. And you can do the same while you are there. In heaven there's so much to enjoy. There are so many resources that you can enjoy whilst you're here on the earth. I was like asking Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do that I may enjoy the benefits that you came to give us? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery. Do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor 
honor your father and your mother? And this young man answers and says to Jesus, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. All this that you're telling me, I've kept it. At the end of the day, if you look at what Jesus told him, what Jesus was telling him is love. Because the whole law and the prophets are all summed up in the word love. Because if you love, you'll not commit adultery. If you love, you'll not steal. If you love, you'll not murder. If you love, you'll not bear false witness. If you love, you'll give honor when honor is due. You'll honor your mother, you'll honor your father. You'll honor the authorities of me. If you love, you, you will not covet. If you love, you will not steal. Come on. It's all summed up in love. So, Jesus is telling him, love. Now watch. Jesus said all that. Right? He said all that. He says, you know the commandments. And he told you what you should not do. And then he answers and he says, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looks at him, but I like this, watch him. Je then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. You see that? Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you you do all that, but one thing you lack. You lack love. Because watch the instruction. Go your way. Go your way. You see that way that you think you've kept? Go your way. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Because when you give to the poor, when you give to the poor, you're lending to God. Did you know that? When you give to someone less fortunate than yourself, you're lending to God. And God knows that that loan needs to be repaid. And God will repay you that loan with interest. It's true. Very true. I've seen it happen in my own life. I've seen how, you know, I would so close them and close them down. You see, I started in ministry and I had one suit. That was my funeral and wedding suit. If there's a funeral, I wore that suit. If there's a wedding, I wore that suit. That's the suit I wore on my wedding day. That's the only suit I had. Go for conferences and I'd look at all these pastors wearing suits. I said, Lord, one day, cleaning my body, taking out the clothes and on you know, purpose to give away. I saw the suit. God said, Give it. Only suit I had. Sharon, you bless me with a suit. 
understand what I'm saying? What you sow, you will reap. If you sow clothes, you will get clothes. Trust me. If you sow food, you will get food. You look like, how can I sow food? Do you know what is real fasting? Fasting is not just abstaining from food. If you go and look at what God says in the book of Isaiah concerning fasting, He says, this is the fast that I desire. You give to the poor. You feed the hungry. You see, that food that you were supposed to eat is still in your house, it's still in your cupboard. You haven't fasted. Yes, you just abstained from eating. But if you can take that food that you would have eaten and you sow it to the needy, Stop 
putting all other things before God. God created everything. If you can put Him first, you give Him the first place. You watch how He'll give you first place one day. We sang that song, I'm a friend of God. You see, Abraham was that type of man. He put God first. God told him, come out from among the children in earth. Come out from among them. Abraham responded. Everything God told him. God told him, sacrifice Isaac, your only son. The one that you asked me for, I promised him to you. That one. Offer you. Abraham responded. What happened? Today, you and I are here. The seed of Abraham's faithfulness. Amen? So he says, in the flesh in heaven, verse 22 says, But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. But Jesus is saying this, Do not become so earthly minded that you focus on earthly possessions. Because the God you serve, bigger than what you possess. He's able, you see that? That was Abraham's mentality. When Isaac asked my father, here's the fire, here's the wood for the fire, where's the sacrifice? Where's the offering? Abraham looks at Isaac and he says, my son, the Lord himself shall provide for himself the offering. What Abraham was saying then, is that the same God who gave me the same child will give me the same child. Because if God would open my wife's womb, 99, 100, you can do it again. Hallelujah.
he suspicions at turning a mess into a miracle. Now I want to share with you from the book of Deuteronomy 23. I was actually just going to read verse 5. But verse 3 and 4 caught my attention and I believe that it's a word that I can share with somebody this morning. And the, the, from verse 3, Deuteronomy 23, the Bible says, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Because, this is very important, he says, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. Wow. Watch what he says here. Bread and water are basic necessities. They are basic, it's basic necessities. It's the basics. Now God says, an Ammonite and a Moabite, they will not enter. In other words, the blessing, God is saying, the blessing that I give you, they cannot, they cannot partake of it. They cannot enjoy it because they did not meet you with bread and water when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Petha of Mesopotamia to curse you. So this draws my attention to the truth the fact that God keeps count. And you see, that's the problem with many people. We hear them, they take on these things, the world, the world throws them at them. It sounds nice, but if it's not scriptural, do not entertain it. It's, as Pastor Sharon was praying, she was speaking about discerning the voices, discerning the voice of God and the voice of the devil. The world teaches you that once bitten, twice shy. You ever heard that? The kingdom of God is a different law. There's a different commandment. There's a different principle which says 70 times 7 in a day. There's a principle which says if they slap you on the right cheek Give them the other cheek also. There's a principle which says, do not repay evil with evil, but rather repay it with good. There's a principle which says, I am the Lord your God, vengeance is mine. There's a principle which says, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. You know why you need to pray for those who persecute you? Because it's a sorrowful thing that God will do to them. You're actually praying that God can be merciful to them. You remember Stephen when you are stoned? Forgive them for they know not what they do. Don't hold us against them. Because let me tell you, whoever touches you, God says, touch not my anointed ones. Say, touch not my separated ones, my consecrated ones. Do my prophets no harm. Because God keeps count. You understand? God keeps count. And when you repay evil with evil, you are playing God and you make no room for God to move on your behalf.
because you've already balanced the scales. Do you understand? God is just. So when someone does something bad to you, repay it with good. Always try to keep that scale in balance. Because God looks at that and when he sees you, you are doing the level best you can. Then God comes down and God moves on your behalf. Because now the scale will still be out of balance. You may find that this sometimes will go so, you do so much that the bad that was done and the good that you continue to do outweighs the bad. But when God moves on your behalf, remember the scales have to balance. God will bring it into perfect balance. God will move now. This is what God says. Remember, when Israel came out of Egypt, they went past the Ammonites and the Moabites, and they refused to share with them bread and water, basic necessities. They refused, remember, they refused to give them food because they were hungry. They refused to give them water because they were thirsty. Remember what will be said in that day. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in prison and you visited me. You remember that? You remember that? Now God is saying here, they will not partake of this blessing. Because they didn't want to share with you. And even more so, they got Balaam, the prophet of God, to try to get him to curse you. But Balaam could not curse because God had already blessed. I'm yet to find somebody that can shut the door that God has opened in your life. I'm yet to find somebody who can curse what God has blessed. You with me? Because if God has blessed and you want to curse, if God has cleansed and you want to declare unclean, you'll face God. Hearing what I'm saying? And then God goes on to say this. Now this is the foundation of my message. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in spite of the fact that they didn't want to give you bread and water, in spite of the fact that they got somebody to curse you, the Lord your God will not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God, highlight this, the Lord your God, Turn the curse into a blessing for you. He turned the curse into a blessing for you because, highlight this, because the Lord your God loves you. You see that? God loves you because of his love for you. God will turn things around for you things that were not that were not working in your life because of his love for you god will turn it around his love his love is amazing god's love is amazing so regardless of the wrong turns that you may sometimes make in life regardless of the wrong decisions and the wrong choices you may make in life God's love is always constant. His love never changes. God doesn't change his mind concerning you. You see, man, people may change their minds about you or change their opinions about you, but the opinion of man does not matter. The opinion of God is always greater. Say amen to that, somebody. His love is always constant. You may mess up. You may mess up. We all mess up at times. You may mess up. But your mess up does not make God love you any less. He still loves you the same. Come on. Man will look at you and say, Ooh, no, I give up on that. <laughs> I give up on that. But not God. God will not give up. Because when you read the book of Romans chapter 8, 
the Apostle Paul says, he makes it very clear. He says, nothing shall ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So when we make mistakes, God doesn't change his mind. He still loves you. Say amen to that. You see, and because of his loving kindness, God is able to, he can turn what may look like a mistake into a miracle for you. It may look like, you say, oh Lord, what did I do? Lord, what did I do? God can take what you've done and turn it into a miracle because there's no situation that God cannot turn around. Come on, somebody. There's nothing, there's no situation that God cannot turn around. There's no mess that God cannot fix. There's no night that God's light cannot penetrate to. No matter how dark it is, God's light will always penetrate through because of his love. Even in situations that you may, you may be of the opinion that it is hopeless, but God knows exactly how to intervene on your behalf. And he knows exactly how to organize a divine rescue for you. How about somebody? You remember Joseph. Joseph was thrown into the pit by his own brothers. And whilst he was in the pit, God, God already knew. Listen, God knew well in advance what Joseph's brothers were plotting against. God knew. He knew, I'm going to give Joseph a dream. And I know Joseph is going to, he's going to tell his brothers. Because sometimes, you see, sometimes, God can give you a dream and you share it with somebody. Not everybody's going to celebrate your God-given idea or dream. You must, you must understand that in life. Not everybody is going to celebrate it. Not everybody's going to be pleased with it. There are those that will celebrate it, and there are those that will curse it. And God will deal with those. You understand? So God knew. You give Joseph a dream, he share it with his brothers, he share it with his father, and yeah, because of that, you know, there's a special favor that he has with his father. His father will give him a coat. It will make his brothers even more envious. And because he's an obedient child, you see, obedience is key. He's an obedient child. He obeys his parents. That's why you've got to obey your parents. You've got to honor your parents. Because he's obedient. His father will send him one day, and when his brothers see him coming, they're going to plot against him. And I know it's going to happen on that day. So because it's going to happen on that day, I'm going to move some Ishmaelites that are going to move on a specific day so that when they throw Joseph into the pit, by that time, it will be a short space of time that the Ishmaelites will meet up and the Ishmaelites will make a trade. And that is my divine trade to exchange, to take him out of the pit and to move him towards his destiny. Because this Joseph that I have chosen, I'm sending him in advance to save a nation. God knew that. Hence, God already pre-planned, he pre-ordained, he predestined that the Ishmaelites will be there. So God knows how to work a divine rescue. Because in Joseph's mind, he could have been in the pit and probably running through his mind, the biggest mistake I made was sharing my dream with my brothers. Come on, some of you have also been there. Maybe I'm preaching to myself. I've also been there. I say the biggest mistake I've made was sharing this so and so. That's the biggest mistake I made. And you think, oh, man, why did I ever make this mistake? But you know what? God takes those mistakes and he works it out for your good. 
in spite of the mistake you made, because of his love towards you, God will turn, it, turn that mess that you made, he'll turn it into a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle what happened in the life of Joseph. It was a miracle, because he would have been left there for dead. But God orchestrated a divine rescue. He does a miracle that he goes to a land where he's a slave and he becomes the second in charge to Pharaoh. He becomes a governor without an education, without a scholastic achievement, he becomes a governor in a land he's a prisoner, in a land where he's a slave. Why? Because of God. I'm not saying education is not important. It's important for you to educate yourself. It's so important. You need education. And sometimes that's the mistake we make in life. We neglect education. It's a mistake we make. We neglect it. And then we pay the price for it later or during life. And then you start saying, oh, I made a mistake. If only I would listen when I was in school. Listen, if you can trust God, you're never too old to learn. About a year ago, I think over a year, yeah, about a year ago, there's a lady, I was so moved, a lady at the age of 70, 70, 70, graduated from UNISA with a degree at 70. Who told you you're old? You're still 50 or 60 and you complain you're old. If a 70-year-old could do it, what, who you think you are? What makes you different? She did it at 70. You may say, yeah, but what she's going to do with it at 70? At least, listen, do you know if you stop learning, you're giving your brain a break. And when you give your brain a break, you're most prone to get things like amnesia. Come and talk to me, somebody. You're most prone to get those, you know, those illnesses of the mind. Where you forget stuff and you can't remember stuff. Why? Because you're not exercising. Your brain needs to be exercised. Wouldn't you like to at least a day you go face God, your brain is not smooth? Now I remember once growing up in school, a teacher told somebody, hey, you've got a smooth brain. And this child thought, my word, the teacher's telling me my brain is smooth. Later on in life, you discover in biology, hey, <laughs> You know, you need some kinks. So what the teacher was telling him is, you have a brain you're not using. You understand what I'm saying? So God knows exactly how to intervene on your behalf and organize a divine rescue. You may find that, yes, that same woman at 70, somebody is looking for someone. She may not have the experience, but she has the life experience that they may require. You know what I'm saying? God can intervene. Amen. Hallelujah. God knows how to fix our lives. In the kingdom of God, there is no DIY. You with me? There's no DIY. What is DIY? Do it yourself. My personal definition of DIY is destroying it yourself. In the kingdom of God, there's GDI. God does it. I mean, look, listen. If you read your Bible, Genesis to Revelation, it's amazing how many times you hear God saying, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. You come to the Gospels, even when they came to Jesus, if it is your will, I will. I will, I will, I will. He's, he's a God who's always giving. He doesn't hold back. Love doesn't restrain. Love 
gives. So God, He knows how to fix your life. Remember, He is the potter, you the clay. So He knows, even you know things in life, you are the clay. And things in life may have broken you so much so that all you see is tiny fragments, tiny pieces. But God is the potter. He knows how to put it all back together again. He knows how to make it perfect. He knows how to mend that which is broken. And even in times when you don't know what to do, God still knows what to do. Always have this in your mind. I may not know what to do, but I serve a God who knows exactly what he's doing. Because no matter what happens, God has your life in perfect control. Can you say that with me? God, do, do like this. God has my life in perfect control. He's controlling my life. He's controlling the course of my life. He's controlling the things that are, that are happening to me on the road to my destiny. Because he's in control. Say amen to that. Amen. Remember God has a plan and he has a purpose with your life. And as long as you remain sincere in following God, he will cause everything to eventually work out for your good. Because Romans 8.28 tells us, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Let me tell you, when He says all things, He says, and we know, we know that all things work together. When He says all things, all things is inclusive of your failures and your mistakes. It's inclusive of that. Because, I mean, look, listen, you know, there's accounts of people who are, who've been ex-murderers, ex-robbers, uh, you know, gangsters, mafias, drug dealers. And people consider them as drug lords, people that had that life. Mistakes they made in the past. That, you know, society thought that they, there's nothing that can become of this person. Listen, let me use the word that people will use. They say, that is a rubbish. Because that's society. But you know what God does? That same rubbish that society took and put in the bag and thought, okay, the municipality will take this one away. God takes that same one out of that bag, out of that mistake, out of that pitiful state. And God starts putting them back together. And God starts giving them structure and order in their lives. And God starts polishing them up. And now all of a sudden you find this person is preaching the gospel. This person is serving Jesus. And society wonders, what happened? That was God who happened. Because God knows how to fix things. And God knows how to take those mistakes. And that same person, in that state they were in, they can go to others that are in that state and they can minister to those because they can identify with the prostitute. They can identify with the drug addict. They can identify with the alcoholic because they come from there. Because the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul tells us, God comforts us so that we can comfort others. He strengthens you so that you can strengthen others. He heals you so that you can heal others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me ask you, is there anybody here that God hasn't come through with for anything? Has God come through for you with anything? Has He come and lift up here? If God has come through for you with something, raise your hand. I want to tell you something. The reason why God did it is because God, God did it for you and when He did it for you, He saw that you can do it for somebody else. You must know these things. If God comes through for you, there's a, it's like there's an anointing, there's an enablement that comes with that thing. There's an empowerment now so that you can empower others with that thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You must understand this. In life, nobody is immune to mistakes. You will make a mistake. You will 
make a wrong decision. You will make a wrong choice. But understand that you can always call on God and God will come through for you because of His love for you. When you seek God's help and you align yourself to His will, God will turn things around for you because you get to a place where you say, Lord, it's no more my way. It's your way. You see? You're insuring your car with my way. <laughs> but his way is always better. Some will catch it tomorrow. Okay? His way is always better. God will turn curses into blessings. You will turn your mess into a message. Hallelujah. And I'm closing with a statement that God will turn your scars. You know what are scars? We've all been little children. And you know I'm amazed with children at times. How proud they are of their scars. I will say, see how I got hurt. And I will say, hey, that's nothing. Look at mine. It's like they're comparing who got hurt the worst. It's, it's strange how children, you know, they can, they can glory in these scars because it's just say, hey, I've been somewhere, I was hurt, but I overcame. But as adults, when you scarred, when you are scarred, you don't want it to be made known. So what happens? You become bitter because of that scar. So bitter. Yet you can learn from a child. The scar has made them better. And many of us, many of us, if you look at some of the scars you have, maybe you fell as a child and you say, hey, I remember I was hurt here. And you think back to your childhood and you say, oh, how nice it was those years. Now I have a scar on my knee here and I got that one day playing hide and seek. I was running to go and hide and then I connected with the foul run and it ripped it open. And yeah, that moment wasn't so nice. There's another scar I have on my foot. Tiny scar. Someone was playing, you know, those, those ten pins. You know those, those ten pegs, those thick ones they use for the marquee. Someone was playing with that and tapping it. And they saw happen to mistakenly tap my foot. And I got one here, ran right into the wall. You understand what I'm saying? The scars, these things that happen in your life. And I got scars on both my feet. There's a time I went to school in winter for two months barefoot because in Sunday school they were reading or they were rather teaching on Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Whilst going home from the highway, Brother Felix, you know what I'm talking about, coming down the highway, you know, down Link Road, they were burning in the felt. And I saw the felt and someone was burning, you know, there was grass there, they just cut the grass and they put it on a heap and it was burning. And I said, if Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego could do it, I can also do it, I can walk through the fire. And as I got in, I jumped about so high. <laughs> and I had blisters on my feet. I've got those scars. It was painful then. But you know, often times of sitting at home, and I look at these things. And you know, I can even remember the, the gentleman who hurt me on the foot here. I look at these things and it's not painful. It's actually good memories because I remember and I think, my Lord, I'm so stupid. Oh God, but you know how nice it was when you played hide and seek? It was so nice when you did this, so nice when you did that. You find that those scars now turn they actually turn everything around. So I close with this statement that God can take the scars, S-E-A-R-S, of your life and turn those scars into stars.
Come and give God praise for that. You can take those stars and turn them to stars. Hallelujah. And when you look, you say, man, I overcame. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at what God says in Romans 8. Let me just do this quickly. Quickly, quickly. I've, I've told you. That's the final statement. I just need to share this with you. I shared Romans 8, 28 with you. Going into verse 29, it says, For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. And then it goes on to say, what then shall we say to these things? If God has done so much for us, I mean, if God has made, done so much for us, made us in the image of his son, conforming us to the image of his son, Predestining us, calling us, justifying us, glorifying us. Hallelujah. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, if God could not spare his own son but freely give him up for us. Man, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can? Come on, say that with me this morning. If God be for me, who can be against me? Hallelujah. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you read towards the end of that specific chapter that I just quoted now, you'll find there's a place where Paul says, I am convinced, I am persuaded that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That was there's nothing that can happen in my life that God cannot fix because he loves me. Say amen to that. Come on, let's stand. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we just thank you. Praise you. Bless you. Thank you for your great love that you have towards us. Thank you, Lord God, for your favor upon our lives. Thank you that you are in complete control of our lives. Thank you that you hold all things in the palm of your hand. Thank you for the future that you have already predestined for us. Thank you that just like Joseph, Lord God, you know, O oh Lord God, at which time what will take place. You hold time in your hands. All things are in your control. So we thank you this morning, O oh Lord God, that we have you in our lives, and you are the one that are orchestrating, Lord God, all things to work together for our good. Thank you this morning, Father God, that we can look to you, and we can, Lord God, seek help from you. We know, Lord God, your great love that you have towards us. We just thank you for your love. Your love never fails, O oh Lord God. Your love never runs dry, O oh God. Your love never fades, O oh God. We just thank you, Lord God. You never change, O oh Lord. You remain the same, O oh God. And we thank you, Lord, because of your great love for us. It is well with us. It is well with our families. It is well with our children, with our grandchildren, with our great-grandchildren. It is well with our youth, O oh God. It is well with our nation, well with our country, O oh God. It is well, it is well, it is well, O oh God. We just thank you, O oh Lord God, that even, Lord God, when we don't know what to do, you always know what to do, O oh God. You are the omniscient one, the all-knowing one, O oh God. And we just thank you now, O oh Lord, for all that you do for us, O oh God. Thank you for your faithfulness, O oh Lord. Thank you so much, O oh God. Thank you, O oh Lord, 
salvation. Most importantly, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. And thank you for you, O oh God. Oh, we worship you, Father, because of you, O oh God. Thank you for the plans and the purposes that you have for our lives. Thank you that day by day, we see, O oh Lord God, this great plan and glorious future unfolding Thank you that we do all things are possible. So Father, we bless you, we praise you, and we exalt you. And as we go from this place, oh Lord, I pray that you be with each and every one. Those who travel, Lord, grant them safe traveling passage. In the name of Jesus. Those who are sick, oh Lord, that you heal them. Weak that they receive strength in the name of Jesus. How may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore, in Jesus' mighty name. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Well, the house of the Most High God, both now and forevermore, in Jesus' wonderful name, and the people of God say, Amen. Oh my God. 